Good morning, folks. How you guys, how you guys doing this morning? Nice to be here in Woodstock. Um, I am a musician, as Robin said. I, I travel around uh, Canada and into the United States uh, playing music. Um, people ask me sometimes, somebody asked me last night, actually, I was playing at Wood, Woodstock uh, Christian School. Uh, how many people were at that event last night? For the uh, Oh, nice. Nice to see you guys again. Um, and uh, someone was asking me, how, I, how, how do you get into music? How, how do you get started with music? And um, for me, I got started because I, I couldn't stop. I just wanted to play all the time. And I remember saying to my mom at age five, I remember saying, Mom, when I grow up, I want to be a musician. And she just looked at me and she said, well, son, you can't do both. So there's that. <laughs> Some of you just getting that now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh, so I, and I live in Hamilton. Uh, how many people have been to Hamilton here this morning? Wow, look at all those hands. I usually don't see that many hands go up when I ask people in Hamilton. So that's... Uh, People are, there's a bit of a kind of a, you know, a stigma there. It has been for years about living in Hamilton. I when I first moved there, I wasn't totally sure what I was getting into. Um, and in fact, my, my nephew, who was driving with me at the time over the, uh, the bridge that gives you a lovely view of DeFasco <laughs> and Stelco and the open fires burning into the sky, he, he took one look at this apocalyptic scene. And um, he, uh, next slide, right there. And uh, he said, well, he said, uh, He's a big fan of Lord of the Rings, and he said, um, he said, Uncle Hamilton sort of looks like Mordor. <laughs> Which, you know, he can't, fa he can't fault his observational powers. Next slide. There it is right there. It's pretty close, actually. It's not bad. Um, so my wife and I, we live there uh, in, uh, in, in Hamilton and, and have done for the last uh, 20 years. Um, and I met her 10 years ago, or actually more like 11 or 12 years ago. And, um, and we've, we've formed a life there. And I get to travel all across Canada into the United States. And um, sometimes I get to go with compassion into the field and see what they do on the ground. And how many people this morning have heard of compassion and what they do. Lots of hands going up. That's great. Um, for those of you who, who maybe have not uh, been acquainted with compassion, they started 60 years ago. It started with one man, one man who was preaching to the troops in South Korea. And uh, he uh, was so moved by the people that he met there, particularly the children, um, orphans, uh, people who'd been left uh, fatherless and motherless uh, uh, as a result of the conflicts there. And he, uh, he was so moved with compassion that he wanted to send these kids what they needed in terms of uh, supplies, in terms of um, finances, um, and to really take care of them and walk with them through the struggle of living in poverty without parents as, as young kids. And so he started that, that turned into, started with one child that turned into two children, turned into four, continued to double over the years. And so today, uh, they're serving well over uh, 1.2 million children around the world uh, in various countries, countries like Burkina Faso. Countries like uh, India, Haiti, uh, Rwanda, um, 26 countries around the world. And there's 13 countries that give the aid to provide that uh, support. Canada, of course, is, is one of them. And um, I know that many of you are probably uh, Compassion uh, sponsors already. Um, but uh, there's also an interesting tagline to this, uh, to this history of Compassion is that South Korea stepped forward a few years ago and said, we want to become uh, people who donate money and, and resources to the work of compassion. We don't want to receive aid anymore. We want to give aid to the nations of the world. And so country by country, compassion is trying to work themselves out of a job, which I like. I like the idea of sustainable international development. And uh, compassion is, has, has really impressed me on that front. Um, the truth is, is that they're, they're, they're doing incredible work, and it's actually, it's actually working. You know, these, these kids are actually, we're seeing them escape poverty. We're seeing them stay in country and help the next generation escape poverty. And um, it's just, uh, it's an incredible story. And it's one that we get to be a part of, which is pretty cool. 
Um, so uh, this morning, I always want to sing a, a few songs, tell a few stories uh, to you guys this morning, um, because the uh, the opportunity is, is there to, uh, to to share about missions this morning. And so I want to share about the missions that I've gone on and how that's kind of uh, changed my life, my family, um, in, a, in a very fundamental way. Um, and so I'm going to sing a song here this morning that's... Um, I wrote for my church back home, and uh, this is a song called uh, We Will Overcome, which I believe that we will overcome. Amen? trouble with this thing here. Let's see if I can get this thing fixed. Um, so, uh, so that's a song that really is uh, is born out of uh, the experience of traveling and getting to see the um, the work of compassion uh, on the ground. And uh, we went to El Salvador, my wife and I, back in uh, 2009, and we got to have this incredible experience of seeing. What, uh, what compassion does on the ground. And if you've ever been to visit your sponsor child, you know how it works. The, the kids come from the community 
into uh, the church, the local church, and uh, volunteers uh, and workers from the local community who speak the language, who know the culture, who know the kids, they come and they serve them um, in, in, that, in that local church through, through programs that help them with their, their homework. The kids get clean water, they get food. They get somebody to listen to them, to listen to their stories, and to, um, and to encourage them, you know, in the struggle of what it means to be a child living in poverty, uh, in crushing poverty in many cases. There's uh, the kids that, that live in, uh, in places like El Salvador are oftentimes living on a dollar a day. The parents are sometimes working, sometimes not. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a daily grind, it's a daily struggle, and there's oftentimes very large families living under a very small roof. And sometimes that's all it is is a roof. And that was many of, the, many of, the, uh, of the, the homes that I visited in El Salvador were just, um, I think we have a picture actually of um, some of the kids that live in Hurricane Alley, which is a particular part of El Salvador where natural disasters have blown through there over the years and decimated what uh, is left of the dwellings there. And here you see a wall. Behind that wall, there would sort of be maybe another half wall, another, you know, a little leaning uh, piece of, of, of uh, metal with holes in it so that it leaks in, in rainy seasons. Um, and there's no running water. There's no sanitation of any kind. And oftentimes, there's eight brothers and sisters uh, living with a single mother in these places. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in a place like this, um, it can be very easy to kind of lose hope for the future. And really that's um, the thing that I was impressed with most about Compassion was that they, they don't just give a cup of cold water. Uh, they don't just provide material resources, although they definitely do that for these kids. They also, they also give them something intangible, something transcendent. Something that will, uh, that will undergird uh, everything that, that happens in their life after that moment that they encounter Jesus. So meeting Jesus is really what gives them the hope that they need to believe that they can escape poverty. The, to believe that nothing is impossible. Because of course, this is what their sponsors tell them in, in letters that we write to them. We say, you can do anything through God who gives you strength. And that's not necessarily a message that they will receive from their families, from their communities, from what they see around them. But we know that, that so there is a reality beyond the one that we see and that God is sovereign over that. Next slide. This is a little girl named Sarah. And uh, she's our sponsor child in El Salvador. And uh, we got to hang out with Sarah and spend a day with her. And it was just... Um, well, it was life-changing, you know. Um, people say that all the time. They say, oh, like it was a, a life-changing mission trip or whatever, and I, I think I know what they mean. Um, but the, uh, the, the visit that we had with Sarah was just... Uh, our lives are nothing like they would have been had we not met Sarah. And um, my wife and I... This is my wife, Allison, in that picture. Um, she, uh, she and I had been married for a number of years up to that point, and we hadn't... Um, been able to have kids of our own. We uh, had been to the doctors. We'd uh, had people pray for us. We'd kind of gone through this journey where we'd been praying the same prayer every day for years. And there was silence, you know. And I don't know if you've ever had that, where you've prayed for something a lot. And you felt like, wow, there's just, there's no response. And you start asking questions in those moments. You start asking questions like, like, Lord, are you there, you know? Or do you hear my prayer? Or do you uh, have the power to change my story? Do you love me enough to turn this thing around? And, um, and so that's kind of where we were at at that point, just before going on this, on this trip. And um, I really felt strongly that we still needed to go as, as much as we were kind of down because the doctors had kind of sat us down just before this trip and said, listen, we don't think it's going to happen for you guys. We don't think you're going to be able to have kids because of some medical reasons. And so um, that, was a, that was a crushing blow because my wife had always just dreamt of being a mom. And, uh, and something about this day with Sarah 
Um, she just felt like a part of our family, you know? I mean, she's got a mom, she's got a dad, she's got a, a family. But she just completely opened her arms and welcomed us to El Salvador and welcomed us into her life. And that just meant so much. She didn't know the impact that she made that day, but she really, uh, she really did change things for us. And so um, I want to sing a song this morning that I wrote for Sarah um, on the plane ride home. And um, it's funny, I had, I had written this song. I'd written all the music for it. I'd actually even gone so far as to go into the studio to record it. But I had no idea what it was about. I had no clue as to what the lyric should be for the song. But I, I had enough faith to believe that something was coming, you know? And it's, all you have to do is go on a, a trip like this and have some experiences, and suddenly um, you got something to, to talk about, you got something to sing about. And so, um, so I want to sing this for you this morning, and, and then uh, I'll continue with the story of compassion and how it really changed um, my life, my wife's life, and, and, and uh, impacted our little family. But uh, this, is, uh, this is Sarah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So yeah, so we uh, came back from that trip just really um, with a fresh vision for the future. Um, which was such a, a welcome thing for us because um, we really weren't sure if there was a future for, for that part of our dream. And I don't know if you've ever had a dream when you just, if you prayed for it so much, eventually you start actually praying a different prayer. You start praying that God would take away the desire that you have that is leading to this prayer. And that's kind of where my wife had gotten to. She was really... Um, found it so difficult, even just to come to church like this, you know? I mean, every year there's, there's a Mother's Day service at a church, right? Or and there's often baby dedications, and there's babies born all the time. There's twins, there's triplets. Everywhere we went, it seemed like there was babies, which, was, which is awesome. Um, but when that's the thing that you're waiting for, when that's the gift that you've been praying for for years, um, Sometimes it can be, a, you know, a trigger for your own grief. And, and we really felt alone in this, but uh, they say that one in seven couples across Canada at some point deals with infertility. And so, I mean, in a crowd like this this morning, I'm sure that there's, I'm sure that there's some people here who know what I'm talking about. And, um, and you know the pain of waiting for something that seems to come so easily to so many. Um... And so it was during that time that I just uh, I shot up a prayer. I said, Lord, let's give us some kind of sign, you know, that we're supposed to hang in there, that we're supposed to wait. And, um, and uh, he, uh, he, he gave this song to me, you know. And, and that's kind of my love language as, as a musician, is, is music. And so um, one day this song kind of just came and fell in a sheet from the sky in one day. Um, and uh, I wrote it for my wife, and it's all about waiting. Whether you're waiting for children, whether you're waiting for a job, or healing. You know, people pray for healing for years from diseases that slow them down, that make life, diff life difficult. There's so many reasons why we'd be praying the same prayer over and over again, and just begging with God to hear us. Um, and so this is a song for, for any of you who, who have experienced that. This is called End of the Road. Every night she watches as another setting sun falls from the sky And with it all her hopes are falling Every dream she whispers to the night As she turns out the light well, I will put my arms around her Softly I will speak her name
after coming home that we we really felt strongly that God was leading us to become adoptive parents. You know, we wouldn't be able to have kids of our own, but maybe, just maybe, we could adopt a child who needed a forever family. And so um, we kind of started just the process of of, of that. And um, as we did, we were kind of reading scripture and we realized that really, somebody pointed out to us that that the whole story of of the Gospels is the story of adoption, if you really think about it. It's that God has adopted us into that first family of Father, Son, and and Holy Spirit. And people say, you know, God is love. And what they mean by that is that the Father loves the Son, loves the Spirit, loves the Father, loves the Son. And around and around it goes in a dance, as it were, of love. That God within himself is a community of love already. And that's why we can believe him when he says that he loves us, because we know that he's loved before. And it's into that community that he's invited us through adoption, not through birth, but to join his family. And not just to do that, but to invite others through evangelism and through adoption, to bring others into that family under the banner of Christ. There's a passage of scripture um, that I want to I want to read this morning um, that comes from Galatians and um, let's just take a look at this it says this but when the right time came God sent his son to buy freedom for us who are slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children and because we are his children God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts prompting us to call out Abba father I love that he uh, He not only adopts us, but he gives us the recognition through the Spirit to know that that's exactly what's just happened. Um, And so uh, my wife and I, we started this process and it was, it was kind of, uh, it was tricky, you know, Uh, there was, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of questionnaires and interviews and it was a real in-depth process to become adoptive parents. Uh, We had to take a course to become parents which I noticed nobody else has to take a course to become parents. I'm just saying, you know. But we, um, we learned a lot through that course. We learned how to care for an adopted child in a special way. And um, they have special needs, obviously. They've been through, in a lot of cases, they've been through trauma. They've been through loss. And, um, and so it was, uh, I guess it was right around August of 2009, just after we came back from El Salvador, that we started this process. And... Um, one of the things they told us in the course was you could be waiting for a long time for a match through the children's aid, which was the direction that we decided to go. And uh, we thought about international adoption, but it just seemed like it was going to take a long time and it was maybe going to end in heartbreak, which we we're pretty sure we couldn't take any more of that. And so we, we began the process right in Hamilton, where we live. And um, it was to our amazement that we got a phone call. Um, in April of 2010. After we completed the course and we filed all the papers, they called us and they said, listen, um, we have a possible match for you guys. We have a little boy who was uh, born to a teenage mom, who couldn't take care of him, and um, we want to know if you'd like to meet this little guy, see if it's a match for you. And uh, I remember after that phone call was finished, I hung up the phone and I, I looked at the calendar and I said, Honey, like, check this out. It's been almost exactly nine months since we started the process (laughs) for adoption. (laughs) Interesting, right? Yeah. Nine months, of course, the average gestational period for a human life. Just want to make sure it's the same page there. Um, So, so we, uh, so we just were kind of we're thinking this. There might be something here in this, and uh, we'd been thinking that all along, but. This is the first kind of concrete sign, you know, that we got that we were really on the right track. We went up to meet this little boy on the mountain in Hamilton. That's right, we have a mountain in Hamilton. (laughs) A 
<laughs> it's not much, but it's all we got. But right there on the mountain, in this little, in this little house, uh, there was, uh, I'll never forget, we, we walked up the driveway on this sunny Saturday morning, and there in the picture window was this little mop of blonde curls, these big brown eyes, this big million dollar smile waving back at us, you know. He was told this was his special day and he was going to meet some special people. And he kind of pointed to himself like he understood that. And we walk up the driveway and open the door and this little hand grabs mine and pulls me in. And it was like being pulled into another dimension in a lot of ways, you know. We knew that things were going to change after we walked over the threshold of this door. And uh, we met the Foster family, a wonderful Christian couple who'd been told... Uh, his whole story and, and who had been with him since he was born and actually brought him to church every Sunday since he was born. He was about 20 months old now. And uh, I noticed when I walked in the door that there was a little crib in the corner. And I said, well, okay, who's that? And they said, well, that's, that's actually his brother who's not yet ready to be adopted, but maybe someday if you guys are open to a sibling group, that's possible, which we hadn't considered. We had a lot to think about here. We were like, okay, cool. Um, we were trying to figure out how we were supposed to assess whether this was a match or not for us, you know, because we were just supposed to do that in one visit. So I did what I knew to do, and I got down on the floor, and I started playing with trucks with this little guy. And we're, we're just look, I'm just looking at him, at him into his soulful and somewhat mischievous eyes and uh, just admiring the beauty of this little boy. And out of the corner of my eye, I see my name on the television screen in the living room. And we've been there for maybe five minutes at this point. So um, I asked the foster family, I was like, uh, check this out. And they're like, oh, your name's on our TV. I was like, do you have an explanation for that? And they're like, uh, oh, well, uh, yeah, we were, we were listening to the satellite radio through the television with the sound down, which, you know. <laughs> I tried that to take personally, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I asked, them, I asked them, I said, like, maybe would you mind turning up the volume just to see, you know, what song that is? And they turned up the volume, and it's that song that I just sang for you. It's not the end of the road. And with tears in our eyes and goosebumps all over, we just looked at each other, and my wife and I were just like, oh. <laughs> this is the moment when God answers all the questions you know Lord are you there a fundamental question right Lord do you hear my prayer do you love me enough to change my story do you have the power to do that you know and in one moment he revealed and through quoting back to me the lyrics he'd inspired in me a year and a half before, that he was with us all along. And he was silent, yes, but he just needed a little more time to wrap the gift, you know? And when it was ready and it was time, the gift was perfect, the timing was perfect. We wouldn't have wanted to change anything. And we decided that day we were going to adopt this little boy. We were going to name him Gabriel because he looked like a little angel to us. And um, we would adopt the foster family as well. We would say, like, listen, if you guys would kind of join our extended family so that this guy doesn't have to lose anything else in his little life, that would be great. And they were all up for that. They wanted to adopt him themselves, but they had too big a family already. And so we prayed... Um, for little Gabriel, and prayed that someday his little brother would come along too. I think we have a picture of Gabriel, though. Let's take a look. That's on. Um, that's Allison smiling like I've never seen him smile before, um, in a long time. And uh, that's little Gabriel there. And that uh, that's little Simon. Now Simon, we prayed that he'd be able to join his big brother Gabriel someday. And uh, a year and a half later of nail-biting waiting, you know. He finally came home just before Christmas in uh, 2011. And these little guys are like Mutt and Jeff. You know, they belong together, you know? <laughs> it was right around the time when we brought Simon home that we learned that they had a little sister. <laughs> We're like,
like, how far is this going exactly? <laughs> uh, so we, uh, we said, you know what, absolutely, if she needs a soft place to land, we would like to have Amelia home. And I don't know if there's a slide of her in there, probably not, but it's, this is uh, an older slide presentation. She's a kind of a newer addition to our family, but she finally came home after three and a half years recently, and, and she's, uh, she just totally belongs. Um, and these kids, you know, they needed a forever family. I can't look at them now even without thinking about all of the kids that we served in El Salvador, all the kids who are really looking for someone who will rescue them out of poverty, out of what they're dealing with every day, out of the hopelessness. These are kids who pray the same prayer every day. Right? Sound familiar? They pray to the same God. They sing the same, the songs we're singing this morning, they sing those songs on Sunday mornings as well. And they pray, Lord, deliver us from what we're going through. Show us a sign that you're there, that you hear our prayer, and that you love us and have the power to change our story. And I realized in that moment that really that's us, you know? Like God has a plan to save and change the world. And that's the church. That's us. That's plan A and there is no plan B. God isn't going to miraculously come down in the flesh and do all of this work. We are his body. We are his hands. We are his feet. We can provide the comfort that these kids need. We can provide the proof to them. Because they're asking. They're like, you say you love the Lord. Prove it. Prove it with what you do. And I, there's a little story that I want to show you here in video form. That just Because I, I can talk about compassion all day long. But unless you see it, unless you see the effect that it's had on young lives, um, you, won't, uh, you won't really know how, how it's changed uh, these young people. But there's, there's some four young people here who have grown up. They were compassion kids. Now they're out of that program, and they're all serving the local church or their local communities in trying to help the next generation to escape poverty. And they've got a fascinating story. We're going to take a look right here.
It's funny, Tony, in that, who's the first guy who spoke in that video, who spoke about his table being empty at breakfast. Uh, um, Tony today is, is, the, is, is the IT um, director um, at uh, the Dominican Republican Office of, of Compassion. Um, he's actually traveled across country with Michael W. Smith giving his testimony. And through his testimony, hundreds and hundreds of kids were sponsored. Um, I share that because when you sponsor a child with compassion, it's not just a one-to-one -one ratio of effect. Um, because we know from the scriptures what Jesus does with what we bring him. Right? There's a story of him speaking to the multitudes and people are getting antsy and kind of wanting to get up and go. They're kind of hungry. And his disciples are like, we have to feed these people, you know. And, uh, but we only have like these loaves and these fishes. And what does Jesus say? He says, bring me what you have. That's all he's asking. Bring me what you have and I will do the work of multiplying it. All of this stuff. Michelle, who spoke about her parents calling her a thief and a drug addict, you know. That's what she was going to be. That was her future. Today, she is helping so many young women in the country where she lives, in, in Thailand and in Cambodia, um, to escape um, the, the prostitution and drugs and human trafficking. Um, she's speaking to rebuild lives of young women. And so when you sponsor a child, it's not just that child that you're sponsoring. You're sponsoring all of the future children that that child is going to affect when they grow up. And they start changing the world because that's what they all want to do. I've met all, a whole bunch of them that have graduated from the program. None of them want to leave their country and come to the land of milk and honey and find their fortune in North America. They all want to stay where they are and make a difference. And so I'm a very cynical guy. I asked a lot of cynical questions long before I would ever stand on a platform like this and talk to you guys about compassion. And I had a lot of questions about where does the money go? How much of the money makes it to the end to these kids? And they open their books to me as they do to the government every year in, in an audit. And they uh, showed me time and time again how Compassion has uh, taken the resources that they have and, and uh, done incredible things with them. They're only expected to give 80% by the governing bodies that govern charities in Canada. But uh, they're able to give much more than that. There was, there was a year recently uh, that was, it was 86%. Um, I believe it was in 2013. And, um, and so it's just unbelievable. Most, most other charities can't believe that they're able to, to see that number. But it's because they have so many people who believe in the cause. They believe that lives can be transformed for the kingdom. And uh, this is the best way. In fact, Business Week wrote an article that said, if you want to make one change for the world, sponsor a child through compassion. That's not a Christian publication. They have no reason to say that. The only reason they would say that is if the numbers of the independent studies that were conducted on compassion over a 10 year, 10 year period spoke uh, the truth about what um, compassion does in the, in the lives of these young, young kids. We have a, a passage of scripture I want to read to you this morning just before we uh, close this morning. It's from Micah. It says, He has told you, O man, O woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God? How many people here this morning are a, a sponsor already with Compassion or World Vision or something? Yeah, excellent. Lots of, lots of hands going up. That's awesome. For those of you who did not raise your hand this morning, I would love to meet you at the back. I would love to um, explain more what's involved with, uh, with sponsoring a child through Compassion. Um, we have kids from Burkina Faso here this morning, too. If that's on your heart, you're part of that missions team. That's a wonderful way. You'd be able to actually meet your sponsor child when you're in country uh, on that trip. Uh, Compassion will, will organize that for you. Um, but there's also uh, kids from all over the world. If you have a, a heart for Rwanda or for Haiti, 
Haiti or for the Philippines um, or for South and Central America. There's lots of, uh, lots of opportunity for you to sponsor a child this morning. If you did raise your hand already this morning and you already do sponsor a child, I would encourage you boldly here this morning to step out in faith. Remember that God will multiply what we give to him and he will take our efforts and multiply it to them and there'll be blessings multiplied to us, I believe, as well in many ways. Um, and so if you have kids yourself, and maybe you sponsor one child, but you have more than one kid, consider sponsoring another child so that, so that your other child will be able to write to them back and forth and uh, learn what it is to be a citizen of the world, to be a follower of Christ, to do something um, life-changing for a young child, to change their story forever. Um, if you do sponsor a child this morning, I want to give you a CD of mine as my way of saying thank you for participating in this mission. And um, uh, there's, there's, there, there's lots of uh, advocates that will be at the table at the end to answer your questions and to greet you. So I, I want to thank you guys for having me this morning um, and to share, letting me share my story with you guys on this Sunday morning. And I uh, look forward to meeting many of you at the back. Over to Pastor Robin. Thanks so much. God bless.